Our very first story in our very first episode was about Archimedes. He was trying to figure out if the king's crown was made of pure gold. And when he figured out how to do that, he yelled, Eureka! But that expression isn't the most important contribution Archimedes made to the world. You see, he's also the guy who invented the screw. Archimedes invented the spiraling shape of the shaft of the screw, the part that makes a screw different from a nail. And we could have a long conversation about whether the ancient Egyptians actually had a screw before the ancient Greeks, but we're not going to do that. That is a winding tale for another time, because this story isn't about the shaft of the screw. It's about the head. In the late 1800s, maybe early 1900s, screws were taking over as the preferred way of attaching things. They were popular because you could tighten and then untighten them as you needed to. But of course, to do that, you had to have a screw turner. That's a tool we now call a screwdriver. Screws all had a single groove cut into the top and the screw turner had a metal tip that was a straight edge that fit into it. These turners were super easy to make. I mean, in a pinch, you could even use a coin or the side of a knife, anything thin, straight, and hard. But there were two fundamental flaws to this setup. One, sometimes the screw turner would slip out of the groove, and then it might even scrape the thing you're screwing into. That's bad. And two, while the slot-shaped screw turner can turn a screw, it can't really hold a screw. If the screw isn't stuck into the surface yet, and you don't keep exactly the right pressure on it, the screw's gonna fall sideways. You know what I mean, you've been there. So it's a two-handed job. One hand for the driver, one hand for the screw. And that does not leave you any hands for the two things you're trying to attach together with said screw. It's an imperfect design, ripe for innovation. <sighs> one young man who felt that frustration was named Peter. He lived in a small town in Ontario, Canada, just south of Hamilton. He was what was called a high pitch man. He would set up a table on a street corner or at a county fair and then call people to come and be amazed by what he was selling. Basically, he was the chop matic guy. It slices, it dices. Of 1905. A lot of what he was selling were his own inventions. A new style of cufflinks that wouldn't fall off. A corkscrew that would center itself over the top of a wine bottle. And yes, as cliche as it sounds, he even invented a better mousetrap. At one of these shows, he was demonstrating something called the greatest tool on earth. And it was actually basically a Swiss army knife, so I would argue he wasn't exaggerating. Anyway, he's using the screwdriver feature on this thing when it slips out of the groove on the screw and stabs the hand that's holding the screw. So now his blood's pouring all over the table, horrifying the crowd. Obviously, that was it for sales that day. Nobody's gonna buy a tool that they just saw wound its inventor. So he wrapped his hand in a strip of cloth and went home to think. He imagined a screw head that was self-centering, like his corkscrew, and wouldn't slip out, like his cufflinks. He drew up a design that met both his demands, a square. That's it a square divot in the top of the screw, and a square driver that would fit into it. It worked flawlessly. For the first time ever, you could put the screw on the tip of the driver, hold it horizontally, and it wouldn't fall off. In 1909, he patented his idea. He called it the Robertson Screwdriver and the Robertson Screw. It was named after, well, after himself. He was Peter Robertson. He gathered some investors who were excited about this idea, and they opened a factory to make screws and drivers. Peter was 30 years old and well on his way to becoming rich and famous. The fact that the screwdriver and the screw head fit together perfectly was the tool's greatest strength, but it was also the biggest obstacle to getting it sold. Initially, no one wanted to buy the driver because nobody had the screws that go with it. And then no manufacturers wanted to use his screws on their products because none of their customers had that kind of screwdriver. After four years of struggling, Robertson got his big break. Just down the road from his screw factory, 
Fisher Auto Body opened up. It was 1913, and they were making the wooden frames for Ford's Model T automobiles. The Model T was more than a motor car. It was the symbol of an industrial revolution. That's from an old newsreel called The American Road. It was made by Ford in the 50s, and it's a fun look back at the auto industry in the early part of the century. Back in Detroit, Henry Ford wondered how he could bring the price of the Model T down to where everybody could buy it. With that in mind, this factory in Ontario started using Robertson screws, 700 of them in every frame they built. They saved time because the workers could assemble them more quickly. And they saved on materials, too, because the screwdrivers didn't slip and damage the wood. But the battle against wasted time and wasted effort was being won. They saved an incredible $2.60 per automobile. Now, to put that in perspective, the whole car retailed for less than 400 bucks, and they were making a million of them a year. So, yeah, 260 was a big deal. In fact, it was a big enough deal to catch the attention of Mr. Henry Ford himself. As the American road became better, the cars that drove along it began to change. They became larger and heavier, lower and longer. It was the 1920s, and Ford was making plans to replace the Model T. The times had changed, and the car that had changed them was no longer needed. He was developing his Model A, the next great American automobile. The highway had become an extension of the city street, and people began to demand boulevard comfort and luxury in their transportation. To build this new car, Ford wanted a new screw, a version of the Robertson screw designed for metal. But he wanted them made in America, and he wanted to control the production, and he wanted exclusive rights to use them. Robertson had already tried to set up manufacturing plants in England and in Buffalo, New York, by relying on local partners, but he'd gotten burned both times. So, this young Canadian, just a few years removed from selling cufflinks and corkscrews at the county fair, turned to the greatest industrialist in the Western world and said, No, I'll make them here in Canada, and I will sell you as many as you want, but I'm not giving up control over production. And to that, Henry Ford replied, Go screw yourself. Or at least something very close to that. And he cancelled Robertson's contract to supply screws to the Fisher Auto Body factory. A decade later, an American patented the idea of a screw head that resembled a four-pointed star. It's now known as the Phillips head. It had many of the same advantages of the square head screw, although... And, okay, maybe I'm just showing my Canadian bias here, but you have to admit the Phillips is a little more prone to stripping than a Robertson, and it also doesn't hold the screw as well. Anyway, rather than produce them himself, the inventor of the Phillips sold licenses to anyone who wanted to manufacture them. General Motors used them in their 1936 Cadillac, and from there, the market exploded. The airline industry, the railroads, and yes, even Ford, quickly adopted it as their screw of choice. 20 different companies bought licenses to manufacture Phillips head screws. And then the Second World War broke out. Hundreds of thousands of tanks, jeeps, and planes were assembled in the next few years, and virtually all of them were held together with Phillips screws. As the Allied forces claimed victory in Europe and the Pacific, the Phillips screw head claimed world domination as the most popular screw design on the planet. The square-headed screw has remained popular in Canada. Boat builders, furniture makers, and deck builders especially love them. But in America and around the world, they're really just a curiosity. I'm Dan Riskin, and this is Inside the Breakthrough, How Science Comes to Life, an original podcast by Symar. Who is Symar? Well, they're a group of researchers in Manitoba, Canada, with a new approach to type 2 diabetes that they want to bring to market. And who am I? I'm a scientist. I'm a bat expert. I'm a former TV host on Discovery Channel. And I'm the host of this show. If you're new to the show, here's what we do. We tell stories about science and innovation from the past, like that one about the Robertson screw, 
and then we draw connections to the present. The reason I started with that story today is because it's about a tool. And today's show is all about how the tools we use fundamentally impact how we do things and even what we try to do. And sometimes you spend centuries wanting to do something, but you can't until someone invents a new tool. There was a time that the Royal British Navy was the most powerful military force in the world. There was a saying that the sun never sets on the British Empire, and that was thanks to its ability to connect and protect its colonies all around the planet. In the summer of 1707, the British Navy attacked the French port of Toulon. Now that's on the Mediterranean coast. It's about halfway between Marseille and Cannes. Today, it's home to the mega yachts of the rich and famous, but back then, it was a major stronghold for the French Navy. The British attacked from the sea, and their allies, the Army of Austria, attacked from the land. There was a massive battle followed by a three-week siege. And although the Austrians failed to take control of the city, every single Navy ship there, including 46 massive warships, were sunk right there in the harbor. The hero of this conflict, from the British perspective anyway, was Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel. Now, you might be thinking, nobody names their kid Cloudsley anymore. And you're right, and I'm gonna tell you why. On the way home to England, Admiral Shovel, that's Cloudsley, and his fleet of 21 ships sailed past Gibraltar and turned north towards England. The Shovel was on board the flagship, HMS Association, a 90-gun ship of the line with a crew of 800 men. It was October and the weather wasn't great. There were storms blowing in from the Atlantic, punctuated by days of fog. It was an unpleasant trip, but hey, it's the Royal British Navy. This was nothing they couldn't handle. The association hit first. Rocks from an unseen shoal tore apart the boards under the starboard bow. Water rushed into the hull, which began to go down nose first. Then a wave caught the stern and she rolled broadside. Inside, cannons from one side of the ship broke free of their mounts and tumbled across the gun decks, crushing anything and anyone in their path. Those men died instantly. Hundreds of others drowned as water flooded the ship. Many of the crew never even had a chance to get out of their bunks. In just four minutes, the entire ship sank to the bottom with all her crew. The sun had just set an hour before, and under the darkening skies, the rest of the fleet had no idea what had just happened. HMS Eagle hit next then the Romney. Then the much smaller HMS Firebrand with just 50 sailors on board also found the rocks. Together, the wind, the waves, the rocks, and the darkness made rescue attempts impossible. It was, and still is, the most severe maritime disaster in British history. Almost 2,000 men died that night. And it was all because Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel didn't know where he was. Ships from many nations were crossing the world's oceans quite regularly back then, so you might think they had a pretty good grasp on finding their latitude and longitude. And if you think that, you're half right. Latitude, that's how far north or south of the equator you are, that was pretty well understood. Now, if you're holding a globe, those are the parallel lines. They're concentric circles. There's a one at the equator, and then they get smaller as you move north or south toward the poles. You can look at the position of the sun at its highest point or at the position of known stars and calculate your latitude pretty easily. You don't really need any fancy tools. You just have to measure an angle. Longitude, that's a lot more complicated than just measuring an angle. Longitude is how far west or east you are. Unlike lines of latitude, which are parallel, lines of longitude are not parallel. They meet at the poles and they spread out at the equator, 
And the numbers on them? Those are totally arbitrary. Latitude starts zero at the equator, but where's zero for longitude? Could be anywhere. Could be London, could be Moscow, Philadelphia. You could put it anywhere you want. So let me put it this way. Latitude is empirical. It's based on the rotation of the Earth. It's something you can measure. Longitude is relative. The lines and the degrees, they only tell you how far you are from other arbitrarily chosen lines and degrees. The only way sailors could calculate their longitude was something called dead reckoning, and it works like this. Basically, you have to know where you are when you start, and then you figure out which direction you're going, and how fast, and how long you travel for, and then you just add on that distance, and that's where you are now. The only problem is your speed and direction on a sailing ship are pretty hard to measure. There's wind, there's waves, there's currents that can push you off course. And measuring speed through the water was usually done by throwing a piece of wood overboard and watching how fast it drifted away. So, not totally accurate. In response to the disaster in 1707, and of course hundreds of other tragedies at sea, the British government hatched a plan to find a solution. In 1714, they passed the Longitude Act, which offered a £20,000 cash prize for anyone who could solve the problem. The 20,000 British pounds back then translates to about $5 million today. Can you imagine $5 million just to solve a fun problem? I mean, that's even better than the bragging rights you would get for solving the challenge, and you also, by the way, would get the bragging rights. Most everyone agreed that the problem came down to measuring time. That's because longitude is intimately connected with time. The Earth spins 360 degrees every 24 hours. So divide by 24, each hour is 15 degrees. So if you know it's exactly noon where you are, because the shadow's short, and you know it's exactly 1 p.m. back home in London, England, then you know you're exactly 15 degrees west of London. And it really is that simple, but there's just one key tool missing. You need a clock that tells you what time it is back in London. You need a reliable source of reference time. Most clocks in the 1700s used pendulums, you know, like a big grandfather clock does. A pendulum, as you can guess, is not really all that useful if you're on a ship on the ocean. The motion of the boat messes up the motion of the swinging pendulum and the clock tells you the wrong time. And if you're off by just one minute, it means your calculation will be off by a quarter of a degree of longitude, which on the equator is like 17 miles. And that could be the difference between safely entering a harbor and ending up on the rocks like Admiral Sir Cloudsley Shovel. So with a big pile of money on the line, not to mention the lives and livelihoods of thousands of sailors, the ideas came flooding in. Now, some of them were nuts. Here's one. I think this one is the worst. So here's, here's the plan. At exactly 12 noon, someone dips a knife in a special powder and then stabs a dog. And then that dog is taken on board a ship, and every day at exactly noon in London, the person who did the stabbing is going to dip that knife in the powder again. It's called sympathy powder. And the dog magically, out in the Atlantic Ocean, will yelp, because that's how it works. So this tells the captain that it's midday in London, and they can calculate their position. It's a great plan, except for the part about the magic dog. Other than that, foolproof. Other attempts were more scientific. A hundred years previously, Galileo had suggested that with sufficiently accurate knowledge of the orbital periods of Jupiter's four brightest moons, uh, you could track them as a universal clock. And some people in England had to revise that idea, but tracking four tiny moons around Jupiter when you're on a ship that's rolling in the sea, it, it just didn't work that well. Sir Isaac Newton, the gravity guy, Edmund Halley, the comet guy, and Giovanni Cassini, this cool engineer astronomer guy, they'd all taken a crack at this problem, but none of them had succeeded. So it was that a young, poor carpenter with nothing to lose started making clocks out of wood. John Harrison had been fascinated by clocks since his childhood. See, when he was six, he contracted smallpox and he was stuck in bed, and his only diversion was a watch. Legend has it that he took it apart and put it back together again, which would have made him a very impressive six-year-old. I have three kids, I have seen them all at the age of six, and all of them would have been able to take apart a watch, but putting it back together? I mean, 
I'm not talking about just putting the battery back in. I'm talking about a spring-loaded wind-up watch taken apart and then put back together. If the stories are true, Harrison was definitely destined for amazing stuff. Watches of the time were useful, but here's the thing. They needed to be reset every day. They would gain or lose a minute or two every 24 hours. That's why even centuries later, you would see men glancing up at the tower clock in a city square and reaching for the pocket watch to synchronize their time to what it said on the big clock in the middle of the city. And you can't do that in the middle of the ocean. To win the prize, Harrison needed a clock that had the portability of a pocket watch, but the accuracy of a pendulum clock. Over the next 15 years, Harrison made a series of clocks. They had a couple of unique features, not least of which is that they were largely made of wood. And not just any wood, Harrison used lignum vitae, a hardwood from North Africa that is so oily, it doesn't need lubrication. Now that was crucial because lubricants act differently depending on the temperature, and this clock was going to have to give the same time in the frigid North Atlantic as it did in the steamy Caribbean. The other amazing thing inside Harrison's clocks was a grasshopper. Not a real grasshopper, of course, that would die and not really be very useful in a clock. This was an oddly shaped piece of wood called a grasshopper escapement. Rather than having two geared wheels that interlocked, the grasshopper hopped along the top of the gear, jumping from groove to groove. This approach meant less friction, and that meant less lost time. In 1930, he presented H1, his first marine chronometer, to the Board of Longitude. They declared it worthy of a sea trial, and just six years later, now, you think I'm going to say six years later it was approved, but this is a government agency. So, no, in 1930, they declared that it was worthy of a sea trial, and six years later, they tested it. That's how governments work. Anyway, the results from the sea trial were mixed. The clock lost some time on the outboard journey, but it held perfect time on the return trip, and Harrison went back to his workshop and took that information to build... H2, his second prototype. This one was smaller, it was more rugged, and it was ready for a sea test in 1741. But Britain was at war with Spain at the time, and the powers that be decided that this clock was really too valuable to risk having it captured by the Spanish Navy, so the trial was delayed. That delay didn't bother Harrison. He was definitely a clockmaker that liked to take his time. In fact, he spent 17 years building H3 and another six years building H4. By now, the available materials had improved and his clocks were much smaller. The H4 was taken on a sea trial from England to Jamaica. And when it arrived in the Caribbean after 81 days, the Sea Watch, as it was called, had held time so well they calculated their longitude to within just one nautical mile. Now that should have been enough for the Board of Longitude to declare him the winner and present him with the cash prize, but there was a sinister game afoot. There was this astronomer, not just any astronomer, it was Neville Maskelyne, and he had been appointed Astronomer Royal. He did some pretty important stuff, including being the first person to figure out the mass of the Earth, but in this story, he's just a bad guy. He's a villain. See, because he was Astronomer Royal, he got to sit on the board of Longitude, and he didn't want some humble clockmaker getting the title. He was working away at his own plan. It involved measuring the position of the moon relative to the stars and calculating longitude that way. It was called the lunar distance method. In fact, his method was tested out on that same trip to Jamaica, and it was pretty good. It just wasn't anywhere near as accurate as Harrison's clock. But when it came time to report the findings, Maskelyne claimed that the accuracy of the clock was just due to luck. He said the clock ran both fast and slow, and that these two inaccuracies had just cancelled each other out, and since he was on the board, and Harrison was just a carpenter from Yorkshire, well, you can guess which story they believed. But then something incredible happened. And I have no idea how he pulled this off, but John Harrison got an audience with the king. He gave King George III his latest prototype, H5. George checked it every day and found that it held time to within one-third of a second per day. The king 
instructed Parliament to pay Harrison his prize money immediately. And so, at the age of 80, John Harrison could rightfully claim to have invented the tool that solved the longitude problem. He got the money, and you'd better believe he got the bragging rights, too. He died three years later. Now let's turn from sailing to pharmacology. And to do that, I also want to bring us into a more modern time, all the way up to the 1970s. And I'm going to lean on Dr. Wayne Lott, Simar's founder, to walk us through this next tool story. Back in 1976, we were studying the effect of nerves on glucose metabolism in the liver. Dr. Lott was studying the way our bodies deal with sugar in the blood. If your body doesn't deal with it well, it means you have diabetes. It's a complicated process, and he was trying to isolate the role played by the liver. In order to get a biological record of what was coming out of the liver or going into the liver, we had to take relatively large samples of blood from arteries and veins. Relatively large samples. That was a problem because they're doing these experiments on small animals, rats and mice. Then 15 years later, 1991, new technology was developed where we could measure glucose and get the response back within 90 seconds based on one drop of blood. It was a new tool, a new way to collect readings, and it improved workflow hugely, mostly because they needed fewer rodents to run the same number of experiments. It wasn't perfect, though. You see, if you needed samples at multiple intervals, say every three minutes, starting when you introduce a drug, even if you only need a single drop of blood, you still have to purge the catheter every time you draw a sample to make sure the drop you're sampling is fresh. So there's a lot of blood getting wasted. And that's a problem because rats and mice don't have a lot of blood. So what we developed then was a piece of technology. It's an arterial venous shunt. We put a catheter in the artery draining blood from the artery, we put another catheter in the vein so that the blood simply comes outside the body, out the arterial side and back into the venous side in basically a completely normal way just with this shunt. In the middle of the shunt, we have a silicon tube that now when we want a blood sample, we simply puncture that tube and pull your one drop of blood and get your sample. It was a simple tool that kept the blood flowing back into the animal in a close to natural way, but allowed Dr. Lott's team to take samples at whatever schedule they needed, one drop at a time. More recently, Lott's team at Symar has developed another new tool. This one isn't really a piece of equipment. It's a powdered meal kit. Why? Well, if you're testing how a person's body reacts to eating a meal, you need them to eat a meal. But if you want to tease apart subtle differences among your subjects or within your subjects, you need them all to have the exact same meal. Studies in the past that have looked at meals have had the problem of dosing and standardizing. So we determined that we were going to make a test meal. It's not just a sugar pack. It has protein, carbohydrates, fats, everything to mimic a real meal. The packaging is really quite neat. It comes in a bag. This is what I always find interesting about people like Wayne Lott or John Harrison. While the general population is focused on solving the big issues, the longitude problem or curing type 2 diabetes, they're obsessing over details like the grasshopper escapement or the packaging of a meal kit. And that's the test meal. After a person drinks their meal, they can track their glucose and insulin levels and determine if they're pre-diabetic. That is to say, if they are on the road towards developing type 2 diabetes. Now, let's say that person makes lifestyle changes, like increasing their exercise routine. Okay, so then they come back three months later and they do the test again. But this is the key. They use the same standardized meal kit. So those measurements show if their changes had any effect. It's a pretty cool little tool. Accurately measuring what happens in your blood every time you eat is just one step in demonstrating the importance of a hormone called hepatolin. It's like when John Harrison's clock showed the correct time when they got to Jamaica. Accurate measurement, whether it's the passage of time or changes in blood sugar, is crucial to good science. And it's crucial to Symar's research moving forward. I'm going to save the details of that for our next episode, when we look at double-blind clinical trials. So that's it for my talk about tools. I'm Dan Riskin. Thanks for joining me on Inside the Breakthrough. 
how science comes to life. One last thing. It's not just me being a biased Canadian that says the Robertson screwdriver is the best. An independent study by the magazine Consumer Reports, which is American, by the way, declared it as far superior in every way to the Phillips. So maybe one day it'll make a resurgence. Maybe it'll overtake the Phillips head. And if it ever does, Robertson will finally get credit for the taming of the screw. Listen to more of Inside the Breakthrough with Dan Riskin, now streaming on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts.